they played that thing for days and they would love to stunt, try and stump each other by typing in their own word primarily. This is Antic, the Atari 8-Bit Podcast. I'm Kevin Savitz. Ed Stewart and Ray Lyons co-wrote Letterman, an educational word game that was first available in the winter 1982-1983 Atari Program Exchange catalog. Ed also wrote two articles for Antic Magazine, Hokey Pokey Interrupts on Using Pokey Timers in a Sunday Language, and Talk is Cheap, a one-bit audio digitizer. Ed also had two articles in Compute's second book of Atari, Memory Test, and Back Up Your Machine Language Programs with BASIC. Here's what the winter 1982 APX catalog said about Letterman. Letterman by Ed Stewart and Ray Lyons, recommended for ages 8 and up, written in BASIC a non-violet hangman for one to two players. Has it ever bothered you that a game as fun as Hangman has a violent underlying premise? Well, here's a variation on the traditional paper and pencil word guessing game that replaces a dismal outcome with lively animation, colorful graphics, and amusing sound effects. The only object in danger is the apple on Letterman's head. You have six turns in which to guess the secret word, one letter at a time. Either the program or another player can choose the word. Letterman contains nearly 400 words within three selectable difficulty levels. And when you've exhausted this list, you can continue to enjoy Letterman because the user manual contains easy-to-follow instructions for adding to, if your system has more than 16K of RAM, or revising Letterman's list of words. Owing to different computer memory requirements, the cassette and diskette versions differ slightly. Both versions work as described above, however, the diskette version offers some added features. You can request hints if you get stuck. You can also choose to play under a time limitation for making each guess. And the program can keep track of as many as nine players' turns and scores. The authors invite comments by mail and telephone. Review Comments The graphics features and lively, friendly approach used in every aspect of Letterman make this program especially appealing. The user manual is very good. Requires Atari Basic Language Cartridge. Order information. It was available on cassette, which required 16K of RAM, or diskette, which required 32K of RAM. Either way, it cost $22.95. It was APX catalog number 20096. This interview took place on September 15th, 2016. The first voice you'll hear is Ed's. Back in the 60s, I started uh, working at BF Goodrich in Akron, Ohio, in what they call the tab room at that point. And basically, it's punch cards, and that's the days when uh, you know a large computer was 4K or 8K, and there were tapes, and there were punch cards, and you would have sorting and lots of things like that. So that's Mm -hmm. where I started in computing and in the mainframe area back in the 60s and 70s. Excellent. And what about you, Ray? Well, I, you know, I guess when I was in in college in the late 60s, uh, I was in social sciences, so we had to do statistical programming. So actually I learned Fortran in college because in those days there weren't the statistical packages that came, uh, evolved later. So I was doing punch cards in college, you know, delivering them to the data center and waiting a day and getting the printouts. So mm-hmm. we're from that era. Mm-hmm. Cool. So how did you guys meet? Either, either well, we were in a scout troop that, together I know and when we were in our early teens when we that were sponsored by the Salvation Army I think that and I, Ed's cousin was my neighbor and somehow we all got hooked up at age 14 or so that's my memory what do you think Ed? That's the most uh, yeah prevalent in my memory too there was a, a birthday party I think when we were very young but we didn't really remember much about that one when uh, my cousin was, uh, yeah, your neighbor, but yeah. uh, you know we go way back from uh, from those days, and and we went to the Salvation Army together. We played in the Salvation Army brass band together. We went to college and were roommates together. So, you know, we've been kind of connected for uh, for quite some time. Mm. Cool, nice. And you guys are still you still keep in contact, right? Yeah. 
That's awesome. <laughs> That's yep. awesome. All right, so I want to uh, find out how Atari entered the picture. Maybe we should start with you, Ed. Do you, can you remember when you got it, how you saw it, why you got one? Yeah, I, re- I remember going into um, in Akron in those days. There were gr- grocery stores called a Clicks, and um, off to the side was uh, a guy that had a little store in the corner of the of the building, and he had Ataris. And I really had not uh, researched. Uh, you know, I knew there were apples and Ataris out there, but I hadn't spent much time looking at them. And when I went and saw some of the programs uh, like Star Raiders and uh, things like that, uh, it kind of really intrigued me. So, you know, I I bought one. I was the first one that I know in our area in my groups that bought an Atari and, uh, you know, started playing around with it. And based on my experience with the, the mainframe, I had moved into the mainframe uh, software programming area and so I started uh, dabbling with programming on the Atari and, uh, you know, then got Raymond involved in, uh, in some of our activities. And actually the, the Letterman program that we developed together was in some ways more of an educational project where, uh, I said, let's do something Raymond together and, uh, something specific. And we, we kind of chose that, uh, you know, nonviolent hangman program to, to kind of begin our programming journey together and, and uh, developed it, uh, you know, spent hours together putting it together. And then I think it was only probably afterward we decided that, uh, hey, this isn't a bad uh, program. Maybe we'll try to, to submit it to the uh, Atari program exchange. Hmm. All right. Let's pause there for a minute. Ray, how did you find the Atari? Was it through Ed or some other way? Well, I had I was work, I was in Columbus at the time, and I had worked with Apple IIe's. I think that would have been the model on in my job a little bit. At that time, they only had dis, diskette drives, but so I'd seen microcomputers. But Ed showed up. I forgot. Maybe he visited me in Columbus, and I believe he carried his Atari with him, and uh, that was it. So we sat around, and then you know, within I don't know how long, a few weeks, I ended up buying one. I, is it true, Ed, that they actually sold them in the discount stores? Like what would be Target now in those days, they were different stores around. Was it at Clicks you bought yours, Ed? Yeah, yeah I bought it at Clicks wow. in, uh, in Fairlawn. Uh-huh. Yeah. And there, were, there was one other store in North Canton. Uh, so there weren't that many stores around that actually sold them. Uh, so it was, you know, not not very common. It took a while before it kind of grew. Yeah, I can't remember where I got mine. I probably had to go to a store in Columbus to get it. I don't think Micro Center existed in Columbus, but I don't think it existed at by at the time. I'm not sure though. That's a good question. Uh, so. Why Letterman? Why why a Hangman game? And was this something for yourself, or you were you making it for you know a, a, a child, or you know why mm. why why this? Mm. Well, Ed really started on it. I believe, in my recall, is you started by yourself. You had started you know forming it, and I don't know where you got the idea. Well, we we played Hangman for you know a long time. Uh, before this and we liked you know i like the concept sort of educational and fun to do and and uh you know there are a lot of shoot 'em up games uh, and i liked educational games uh, in general and i you know was at, at the time getting an educational an education degree as a teacher and so uh i thought why not try uh, and make something sort of cute using the atari using as an educational platform but We'll call it, uh, you know, I don't know how it came up with the name Letterman, but we'll call it Letterman and we'll, we'll call, you know, consider it a, uh, a nonviolent hangman where hangman is a cute game, but in the end somebody gets, <laughs> gets killed sometimes and yeah. hung. So, uh, we were trying to, you know, just come up with that, that concept of, uh, combination of education and, uh, and game. And we, and over time as we developed the game, 
we added various features into the game to to let you pick your own words and to play with other people and things like that that uh we developed the, the you know the dictionary and um you know uh that's kind of how it evolved mm-hmm. well, wasn't it true that there was a hangman game that atari published yeah yeah it's yeah, Atari published the Hangman game as well. And I think we looked at that and it was so simplistic, we said, well, we could probably do better than that. Exactly. Well, I tell you, in one of my okay. interviews with uh, one of the, the guys who was, he test, he checked out the software that was submitted to Atari Program Exchange, the one thing he mentioned was just like, so many Hangman games. Everyone submitted Hangman games, and they were sick of them. And, and so, but oh, you, really? you guys are the ones who got one in. <laughs> <laughs> um, so tell me about that process. After you, you finished it, you decided to submit it, and uh, is there any story there with working with the APX people? Uh, I think it was fairly straightforward. I think we were surprised, uh, you know, that it was a little bit surprised, but I think we thought it was pretty good quality compared to the other stuff we had seen. So we thought we would be, I, I, I thought we would probably be accepted into the APX, but I, you know, I was kind of surprised that we won, uh, you know, the second place award that quarter, uh, myself. And as we were, as we were developing the program, there were certain aspects of it that were not you know, satisfactory. For example, we had a, uh, you know, we embedded a, a dictionary and, and it's, you know, different, different um, difficulty levels in the game. And the basic programming language was so slow in some cases that I ended up having to go back and uh, develop a 6502 assembly program and then inserted it inside the program as a, a bunch of strings. So we used that as a subroutine and it went, you know, the selection process for a, for a word went from uh, like several seconds down to, you know, a millisecond. So, you know, that was kind of an interesting process where we, you know, we had to, to develop, delve into some other programming language just besides the basic one that, uh, that they, that they uh, provided to, to get it to actually function. Because without that, it was just, uh, you know, there's no way we could have submitted it. But I think after we submitted it and we were uh, accepted and then won the, the uh, you know, the award, it was pretty uh, pretty exciting for us. Nice. You know, looking at the catalog here, it uh, unless I'm looking at the wrong issue, it doesn't mention that you, you won second prize. Um, it's like they, they forgot to mention that. So tell me about that. Did you got probably five hundred dollars worth of hardware that you could pick out? Oh, gosh, I forget so much about those days. But I think you're <laughs> right. What what did we get? It was there some kind of? Well, we got cash. Did we get cash? I think we got cash. Uh, if I remember right, I just don't recall how much it was. Or nice. Or I don't know. We got royalties, but maybe there was some kind of uh, hardware. Usually there Probably was, but was. I don't know. Yeah, may have been. Did uh, we definitely got a plaque? We oh, got nice. a plaque, you know, nice laser carved plaque. Very cool. How uh, how did it sell? Did you did you make any any money off it? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. For several quarters, you know, we did pretty good. We were pretty happy about that. Nice. Were we talking hundreds, thousands? Give me a. Uh, sense it was several thousand a quarter for you know probably a year yeah wow that's awesome yeah i think it went up there i I suspect we earned more than ten thousand i can't remember yeah i I think so too total combined you mean yeah Yeah. or maybe yeah uh, yeah i think it was probably higher i mean it was a few thousand every quarter i one one quarter got like the six or eight thousand i think so I think it did pretty well, and as a matter of fact, <laughs> after we did that for a while, we started collecting in some cash. Uh, a bunch of buddies that I worked with, all of a sudden, uh, everybody was buying Ataris, and we started an Atari club together, and uh, <laughs> you know, some other people started writing software, so we kind of you know, became uh, local celebrities with our buddies, let's say. Nice. <laughs> That's cool. Nice. Well, also, Ed was uh, at the time had computed or com- had published 
uh, a few articles in Compute Magazine, mm-hmm. I believe. Right. So he, he was somewhat known nationally. Yeah. See, I wanted to talk about that um, as well. You wrote for um, Compute and also, I think, Antic. Did you write the, the Talk is Cheap article for Antic? Yes, I did. Uh, all right. Tell me about that. That did you tell me about that project? It sounds super interesting. It was a uh, fifteen dollar voice synthesis kit. Yeah, I had I had an interest in uh, you know uh, sound and voice synthesis at the time, and I just uh, I, I looked at and studied the in, internals of the uh, the Antic chip and the Atari and its capabilities and the A to D conversion. I had long time interest in that, and on the mainframe I had developed a similar program, so I was kind of used to and interested in the the lower level uh, capabilities and functionality of the of the equipment so uh, you know I did develop that uh um you know that program and uh, assembly program and and uh, you know write the, wrote that article Very nothing cool. ever happened other than you know it was more of an educational mm-hmm. uh interest that I had at, at the time right so I guess it was more of a one bit digitizer not not synthesis yeah. okay Very exactly cool. yeah and uh you wrote hokey pokey interrupts for antic as well um about working with the, the pokey chip in assembly language and then some stuff yep. for compute including two things in the compute second book of atari including a memory test program and uh, uh backing up your machine language programs with basic any memories or stories right. about, about any of that? Well, um, yeah, a little bit because I, when I started understanding a little bit better about how the Atari hardware functions and the fact that the the memory is shared and um, you know the the video processing chip actually kind of interfered with the the other CPU processing that was going on. Mm-hmm. I decided to try, you know, some benchmark tests by by turning the, uh, you know, the video off, and then you know I could perform other functions much faster. And that's when I ran the, and then I, I discovered, well, you just you could even run in a lower level of graphics also, and so there's less memory access by the chip against the memory, so your hmm. your stuff actually runs faster when you run at a, a lower graphics level. So. That that again was more of a um, interest in my evolving uh, evolution and, and understanding of how the how the hardware functions and operates together. Very cool. All right. What else, Ray? Do you have any other uh, projects well, other I, than I Letterman? I just wanted to mention what I think was a weirdness of the of the time time when we did this work. I. I believe the software was only available on cassettes, and I guess diskettes also, but I believe more customers bought the cassette. Uh, that was the medium mm-hmm. that this game came out in. And I think it was true that the cassette reader on Atari was flawed because these cassettes wouldn't read, and we would get calls from customers who bought the software saying it won't load. Do you remember remember any of that, Ed? Uh, yeah, yeah, it was an it was an ongoing uh, problem. We didn't get a lot of lot of uh, you know communications that way, but uh, the reliability of the cassettes was definitely uh, an issue. Yeah. Was you know we started. I mean, the, took, the cassette took, stayed. Didn't uh, loading the game took a couple of minutes? Is that true? I mean, you you'd start the load with the cassette, and yeah. you have to. Well, wait those cassettes were slow. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and your yeah. game came out so people, r- kind of early. It was in 1982, probably before uh, a lot of people had disk drives. So that probably right. accounts for the cassette version selling so well. Yeah, and the base system, I think, only had the cassette option, I believe. I don't remember, actually. I think it came with nothing, and then you had to, to buy one or you the other. You had to buy the cassette extra, but how? Yeah. otherwise you use the cartridge games that Atari sold. Right, right. Cool. Um, all right. So, what haven't I asked you about that time that I should have? Well, what about regrets? Yeah. 
<laughs> looking at the game and saying, "Uh oh, why did we do that? Or why did we do this?" Well, or what do you what would you like to have done differently? Well, well what, I mean, we were, you know, we thought we were doing an improvement on what existed at the time. But when you look at it now, for example, the uh, the opening part of the game, I was the one that put the music in there. Mm-hmm. And it, had we thought about it, we would have allowed the user to bypass that and get the game started. But we ended up playing this little opening, you know, overture mm-hmm. that everybody had to sit through, which now is kind of sorry we did that. Um, I don't know. Some of the sound well, effects, I, I think, are kind of... <laughs> Go ahead. Well, I was just going to mention also, it's, uh, it's a little bit more current uh, information, but... I actually still still play with the game. Uh, I've got a Raspberry Pi, and I loaded the game with with a you know a simulator, and I play it in with my grandkids, and they get frustrated because of that opening. Uh, they said, "Why don't you change the program, Papa, and and, and remove that uh, wait at the opening because they they want to start playing the game right away. We got to wait for the William Tell Overture to finish." <laughs> oh well, you know, I played it this morning, and I th- thought it was cute, but then I only had to sit through it. Once or twice, so <laughs> <laughs> right. Hmm. Well, that'll be the... all that. Well, like I think that only was on. I think the diskette version it was bigger than the cassette version, and I I hope that music was only on the diskette version. Well, after, I hope after I waiting for the cassette, I don't remember. Tour, yeah, you were ready to play. And you... <laughs> yeah, the disc version had a few extra features. I think there was a timer and. Uh, Probably a bigger dictionary. There were some some other features there. It had to do with size, right? Right. Uh, it was also... I was actually surprised when I when I uh, when I finally got it to run on the um, the Raspberry Pi. It wasn't all that hard to to get it to work to function there. When I first showed it to my grandkids, they you know they knew I'd written program written, written programs long ago. They didn't know much about it, but. I was shocked about them and their friends. We played; they played that thing for days, and they would love to stunt, try and stump each other by typing in their own word. Primarily, uh, mm-hmm. <laughs> I was surprised about how much they how much they liked it and uh, played with it for for quite a while. Nice. Oh, it's certainly yeah. It's great that it endured. You know, you can. Uh, it's still a fun game, and if you lose the, you get applesauce. I mean, which is really not much of an incentive to, <laughs> you know. Nothing's wrong with applesauce. <laughs> a dead apple. Right. Uh-huh. Um, what do you both do today, Ed? Well, I, uh, you know, I stayed with computers and I moved to uh, managing large computer infrastructures. And uh, I retired last year, so I'm kind of just relaxing now and going cruising. I've also, uh, you know, starting to learn some Apple programming with Swift and things like that. So I'll probably be doing some, some additional development myself. Excellent. Letterman for iOS 10, right? <laughs> sure. Yeah, there you go. What about you, Ray? What are you up to these days? Well, I'm retired also, and I've worked primarily, I worked somewhat in uh, uh, government, and I worked also in IT for maybe 20-some years in healthcare and newspapers. And I still do some statistical programming with uh, systems like SAS and uh, a, a software called Tableau Public. So I do I still say a little bit active in that area, but otherwise I don't. I'm not really drawn to computers. There was a day when I got really sick of them, truthfully, because I had I, I was going. I think I finished. I had my Atari when I finished graduate school in Columbus and I submitted my thesis on the Atari writer. <laughs> That's cool. Nice. It really, I did. And then on my first job after graduate school, I submitted, I, my resume was printed on a dot matrix printer and that was a, that got me hired. Basically it was such a novelty. Pretty weird. But anyway, <laughs> We yes. used the Ataris for everything. I did banking on the Atari with in CompuServe. Yeah, so I found this blog post from you where where you mentioned that you were uh, doing your your banking on CompuServe via Huntington Bank. <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. weird. This is probably 1982, 1983. Yeah, tell me about that. Check. That sounds crazy. I don't know. Well, CompuServe was in Columbus, 
Huntington Bank was there also, and that somehow they arranged that your bank, your checking account transactions could be transferred to your to CompuServe, and you could actually, I don't really know how that worked, but you could see your balance. You couldn't do any transactions, but you could look at your check roster and balance kind of thing. So, you know, on a 300-bit bond modem, mm-hmm. I believe, maybe 1,200, I'm not sure. So, But we were in the forefront. Now, now we're, myself, I'm kind of, I'd say, jaded on it all. <laughs> We also went on after the Atari when the IBM PCs came out. We uh, we both got involved in developing some some uh, D-based kind of software on uh, on the Atari. I mean, on the IBM PC. We worked together on a couple of projects there. Well, you know what else we we also did was we were trying to do educational games, and after Letterman, we developed a program called Dot to Dot because we wanted there to be everything was you know, shoot them up violence, all the games mostly. So we developed a program. Our second program was, was it called Dots? But it was a dot to dot game. And it included the ability of the users to add their own pictures, make their own designs. Was this also on the Atari? We did it, we did it both. I, I forget, Ed. I thought we did it for the Atari and then trans transitioned it to uh, the IBM PC Junior. But things, I can't remember exactly why, but we couldn't get Atari interested because I think they were starting to decline. And the and we couldn't get educational software companies interested because of the uh, I, I, the PC Junior's uh, kind of unpredictable fate. I mean, right. yeah, yeah. I don't know exactly why, but we sent it to two or three publishers like Scholastic and I forget the others. And it was a complete nonviolent kids game, but it never went anywhere. Hmm. Do you still have that program around, either of you? Uh, I don't. What would it be on? Uh, probably it would be on diskettes, I imagine, because we yeah. from the PC Junior. But I'm pretty sure we did it on the Atari because I remember learning 6502 programming for that project. Anyway, that turned out to be a dead end. Hmm. But I thought. Uh, would be a good game today, actually. Yeah. Oh, cool. Well, if you find those discs, Although, let me know. We'll we'll uh, recover them. That's <laughs> a thing we can do. <laughs> they might be somewhere. Who knows? They might be stuck in a box. If you could send a message to the Atari 8-bit community that still exists, and you can right now, what would you tell them? Ray, you go first. I guess I'm more, you know, like I was saying, I'm a little bit jaded. Uh, if you look at how people look at technology nowadays, I think they forget the past. Uh, I remember somebody talking about how stupid Radio Shack was, and it was a saw online. Somebody commenting, well, good that that chain closed because they were so irrelevant. But had there not been a TRS-80, there would have not have been, I'm not sure, the exact sequence here, but a lot would not be here if these microcomputers hadn't developed among the hobbyists. So I'm all for remembering how that all developed. Yeah. Ed? Well, um, I still stay very, very uh, active with computers and technology, even though I'm retired. So I'd say, you know, the 8-bit the was such a, a simple, nice, easy-to-understand architecture that... Uh, Anybody that's still interested in that, you know, it's kind of, um, um, it's a good place to, to to go and and understand the basics of the complex uh, world of of larger computers, even some of the more complex language. They all are yes and no and zeros and ones. So I'm just uh, happy that I was part of it, and I'm uh, I'm glad that it's still active because I've not been involved really in. And I'm just thrilled that there's people out there that do take an active role in, in managing and, and keeping track and developing the, the emulators that allow us to, to keep these, uh, these old but, uh, you know, still interesting uh, programs and software and, and ideas alive. Good answer. Thanks. Um, great. 
Well, I think I have what I need. Thank you both. Great. Thank you. You're welcome. If you enjoy these interviews and would like to contribute something, I encourage you instead to donate to one of our favorite organizations, the Internet Archive, at archive.org. The Internet Archive is a nonprofit digital library with the stated mission of universal access to all knowledge. They've done incredible things to preserve computer history, including hosting thousands of programs in an in-browser Atari emulator, creating the Wayback Machine, and offering full-page scans of countless Atari computer books and magazines. Make your tax-deductible contribution at archive.org slash donate.